This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. Uh, this will be part one today of Preexistence 101. Preexistence, and I'm setting forward this principle. I'm saying things don't exist before they exist. Okay, that's pretty simple, but actually that is our principle. That's, that's the one we're going to build on here. So it's not all that hard. It is an oxymoron to say something exists before it exists, normally speaking. So, so we, uh, we want to uh, think our way through this. This idea of pre-existence, uh, we find, we're going to think about two versions of it, okay? One is the notion of what we call the Eastern religions, okay? And uh, Greek philosophy fits in with this some. That's, we're not just making this stuff up, it's for real. And then versus, we're going to say, the Bible has a different notion about this whole business of what people are and whether or not they exist before they exist. And so uh, then the Eastern religions and Greek philosophy, here's the kind of stuff that we get into there. Number one, that's this version. People exist in a spirit state before they become human beings. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? So uh, uh, the, uh, and thus they have then a teaching of incarnation. That is, coming into the flesh, or uh, even reincarnation. Coming into the flesh, going out of the flesh, going into the eons of time and so on. Back into the flesh, out of the flesh, back into the flesh. So we have all these sort of incarnations, reincarnations, okay? That's the idea we find in Eastern religion. But the Bible has a different picture. And I think you'll agree with me, this isn't that hard. The, the Bible has the picture that people don't exist until they are created. They're not running around in some other state or form. They're not some kind of spirit being before they actually become human. Hmm, okay. And that is the biblical picture of the, these things. Uh, so we can actually say that... Uh, True human beings are not incarnations or reincarnations of spirit beings, okay? And man is made. Adam was created, right? Ah. Well, that rings true because, you know why it rings so true? That's what the Bible says, okay? Genesis 2 and 7 then said, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became... A living being, a living soul, maybe. But he became a living being. What was he before that? Nothing. He was definitely not a living being of any kind. He became a living being. So that's the biblical picture on this. I, and that, that's what we, uh, we allege, and I think we're safe to say that. You can't, I mean, you might go somewhere and come up with some little off the cuff or weird say, oh, I think they believe people pre-exist. Not really. Uh, I think uh, the Bible is very clear from the beginning all the way through to the end. People don't exist before they exist. Not in any form. Okay. Okay. Let's continue then. To say that people pre-exist themselves in some other form then is complicated. And it is. It gets really confusing then. If, if uh, we have a situation where Matt actually existed before he was Matt, then what were you? And then you get to say, 
well, I don't know. I don't remember that. Well, well, isn't that interesting? We don't even remember we pre-existed, right? So uh, it doesn't, uh, doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. So it's complicated. It's confusing. And most important, it's non-biblical. It's not the biblical picture. Interesting. Okay, let's continue. Thus, I suggest, uh, if I may, and, and with good heart and spirit, uh, I can say, I think we should disavow pre-existence, incarnation, reincarnation, all of that sort of thing. You'll run into it. But don't, don't grasp that. Don't, don't go for it. It's just not right. It's not scriptural. And really doesn't make a lot of sense, as I said anyway. Rather, here's what we do want to grasp. We have a creator, okay? And he is our father. Now that means something, doesn't it? Because... Without him, we didn't exist at all in any form. All right. So we have a creator. He has made us. And he didn't just make a body for the spirit us to get into and walk around in. Ha. Ah, see? In, in the Bible picture of things, actually, he created all of what we are. Adam just wasn't a living being of any kind before God breathed into him the breath of life. Okay. Now, the, Adam then is not a picture. Genesis doesn't give us a picture of uh, God uh, fixing up a body so that some pre-existing spirit being could move into it for a while. Ah, it's not right, is it? It's not true. And uh, so I think we realize that we're one wonderful being that God has made and we're one package, okay? And uh, we don't exist apart from that, from that package. Okay, let's continue. So then we find these wonderful words by the psalmist, one, Psalm 139, verse 14. I praise you, I praise you, O God, I, for I am, listen to this, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Whoa, I like that a lot. And wonderful are your works that I, that I know very well. I know your works are wonderful. If I know anything, I know that, he says. So, wow, I praise you for I, what, am fearfully and wonderfully made. So, we've had this thing that's kind of crept in uh, to society uh, it's a part of the Eastern religions we mentioned earlier, I think. And it certainly has become even, uh, it's crept into uh, our Christian view of things. And that is, our bodies are bad. This is not good. This flesh business is ugly and awful and ew, it's terrible and that's not good. It's the spirit being that moves into the flesh. I don't know why the spirit being would want to move into this then if it's so bad. Why would that be? You know, and the bigger question is even this. If, if this flesh being, this, as they're looking at it, if the flesh being uh, was so bad, why did God make it to begin with? And don't we recall that God said after he made man, among other things, he said, what? He saw that it was, it was good to him. He didn't say, I'm going to hold my nose and, and, and make a flesh body food. No, he loved it. Fearfully, wonderfully made. Beautiful, one of God's wonderful accomplishments. Us. And he made us as a package. It's a, it's a deal. Okay, I like that a lot. Okay, let's continue then. The only sense then in which in the Bible we exist before we exist, and I think everyone would have to agree with this, is in the mind and plans of our Creator. Hmm. Think about that. I think when, when all is said and done, that's not just an idea or a philosophy. That's the truth. Because uh, we know that from our own experiences. If you're going to create something, you have to get it in your mind before it takes shape, right? Because someone who is a sculptor, he, he has in his mind, maybe it flows from his mind, but it, anyway, it starts in the mind. He has a plan. He has an idea. If someone's going to build a house, usually they have plans. Where do the plans come from? Out of their minds. So in the mind of God, God has plans for all the things that he does. So 
We could say that this is right. Man couldn't possibly literally pre-exist himself for all the reasons we just said. But on the other side of the picture, man could, in fact, must, I suppose, pre-exist in the mind of his creator. And that, that's interesting. And that's simple, isn't it? I said we're going to talk about easy things. The, the idea of literal pre-existences and all that gets very confusing, difficult. Uh, and, uh, but actually, the things we're looking at are easy. So here we are. God had Adam in mind then, we think, before he created him. Had to him. I think that's true. God says to his heavenly court, now let's make man. Okay. He had to have in his mind what man was going to be. He had to have in his mind how that was going to happen and how that was going to work. So, Adam, you could literally say, did pre-exist himself in one sense in the mind of his creator, in the plans of his God. So I think that's, that's not hard. So God then went on, he created man. Not a body for man to get into, not a man, you know, that and all that. But he created man in his own image. Wow. And he goes on to clarify, in his image, God created them. Male and female, he created them. So men, men women, all in the image of our creator. Isn't that wonderful? Wow. Okay. You know, I have to say this. This idea that physical stuff is awful, the, the body is, ugh, you know, that actually came to us in large part through a system of philosophy that uh, uh, was put forward by a group of people called Gnostics. And uh, you hear a lot about Gnosticism. It's not just one thing. They had different ideas all going on back there. And uh, in fact, when we do get back to 1 John, the fourth chapter, we're going to see that he's dealing with Gnostics in this very issue in the book of 1 John. And he's dealing with this thing that bodies aren't good. In fact, if you start that in, then what other body won't be any good then? The body of Jesus Christ. Because that's flesh too. Ew. So the Gnostics had real problems with that, didn't they? Yeah, we'll get back to that another day. But anyway, so here we are. God made and created man in his own image. The Gnostics came along and, and they had, by the way, you know where the word Gnostic comes from? With the Greek term? Gnosis. Gnosis. Thank you. Hey, y'all are doing well. So anyway, so the Gnostics, the Gnosis, knowledge, the knowledge people. They just transcended everybody else because they were just that smart or became that smart or whatever. But actually, they weren't all that smart. And uh, the th ideas they came up with don't work. They wound up saying that something's bad, the human body, that God said he really liked. He said it was good. Okay. And uh, he, God looked at all he had made. That would include the human body and said, oh, this is all good. I love it. This is great. Okay, let's continue. That existence in the mind and plan of God is the case for every true human being. I don't think anybody slips by him there. Okay. So if you exist as a human being, God being the, the actual God that he is, nothing gets by him. He knew about you from way back. Yeah. And so here you go. So God says this to Jeremiah. His knowledge, his pre-knowledge of people... Sometimes it does sound like he just, they were just right there with him. But it's not. It's just him talking about the future person. And we have this example in Jeremiah. God says to Jeremiah after Jeremiah is born. He said, I knew you before I formed you in the womb. Hi. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah 1 and 5. Well, I guess you could say, well, okay, then there must have been a spirit person wandering around with God in heaven before Jeremiah was actually born. But that isn't, doesn't prove out at all, does it? As we've said before, what is God doing here? And the Hebrew people understood this very well. This is Hebraicisms. This is an understanding that we're, that's not so hard. God is saying, I knew you. How did he know him? In his mind. Before I created you, I knew you. 
And before you were born, I knew you. Before you were in your, your mother's womb, I knew you. And I did some things. I set you apart uh, and appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. How could he do that? Jeremiah wasn't there yet. In God's plan, he could. In God's plan, Jeremiah was right there before God in that, in that sense. In the, God lays out his plans of the ages. Oh, here's Jeremiah in those plans. Beautiful. Okay, let's continue. That's the kind of preexistence that's found in the Bible. It's not literal preexistence. Okay. It is rather, I prefer to call it conceptual preexistence. Sometimes you hear it referred to by other terms, notional preexistence, but too many people don't quite get the sense of what would mean meant by notional. I like conceptual, concept. Some these people existed in, in the concepts of God, in concept. So conceptual preexistence, yes. And that, by the way, is the Jewish and Hebrew view of preexistence. People in the Bible, people in our Bible, uh, who were Jewish and who were Hebrews and so on, the writers of our Bible, they didn't think of people preexisting in a literal sense, but they did think of them as existing in God's plan, in God's program. So that's tremendous. So then we find to God then, things in his plans are as good as done and he can talk about them as though it was, even though it's not. Not making that up. The scriptures actually teach us that, tell us that. And by the way, that if those of you who may have a, the, a copy of my book, chapter 8 in the book really begins to deal with these questions. And, and from there, all more about that as well. Conceptual preexistence. Okay, let's continue. God said to Abraham, here's examples of this God calling things that are not as like as if they were. You know. And uh, so it's uh, Romans 4.17 this is Paul in the New Testament. He says, as it is written, so he's quoting this from the Old Testament, I have made you, speaking to Abraham, aha, I have made you a father of many nations. Wow. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls the things that are not as though they already were. Hmm. What's Paul's point here? Well, if you search it out a little bit, we discover that God is speaking to Abraham in what Paul quoted from here. And when God speaks to Abraham, he says, I have made you a father of many nations. And the truth is, Abraham, when God said that, was not the father of any nations when God said this to him. So how can God say, I have made you a father of many nations? Because with God, it's as good as done. That doesn't mean some literal preexistence of nations. It just means God's plan is, has got it nailed. He's, he's on it. And so what, what God thinks and decides is as good as done. Okay. Now, uh, then Genesis 17, another, uh, 18, I have another example here. I have given your descendants the land. They didn't exist. How can God say, I did that? You know, we're going to find later on as we progress through this, these series, this series, that Jesus is going to be later on talking about things he had with God. Well, how could he have? Because it was all in God's mighty, powerful, eternal plan. And so here these, this, these people could come back later and say, well, you know, this land we have now, God gave it to us back then. Well, you weren't there. It's okay. In God's plan, you were there. You were in his plan. He unrolled his plans, looked at them and said, oh, here, I've given them this land. I love it. And oh, yeah, and here in my plan, uh, Abraham is going to be the father of many nations. Whoa, I love it. All right, let's continue. So what about us and you then? As we said in this room today, I like this. Sometimes I said our poets get it right. Our songwriters get it right. Frankly, they're usually very well intended and very gifted people, but sometimes they just get it wrong. They're, they are not clear uh, about theology. They're not good theologians. And sometimes, actually, I think they're a bit misled by popular theologies. So they're writing and using their wonderful talents to things that are, uh, you know, not so good in the end. But sometimes they really get it right. And I think this one does. Uh, this song, uh, He Knows My Name, we sing it here. We love that song. But notice this line, and every time we sing it in the future, think about it. Before even time began, 
My life was in his hands. Okay, how can that be? So, for goodness sakes, for Leslie, then, before time began, her life was in the hands of God. I like that. Well, and uh, the answer to that is, our poet, knowingly or unknowingly, he got it right. And actually, you were known by God in his plan. He looked ahead, he saw, he rolled the plan on out toward further down here and he found you. There you are in his plan. And yeah, that's beautiful and it's wonderful. Doesn't mean you were back there literally. That would be ridiculous and as I said, it gets very confusing and all that. But true human beings are in the plans of God. So our lives are in his hands, especially those who are in Christ, Jesus. Our lives were in his hands in the hands of God, before time even began, we said. So Ephesians 1 and 4 brings us this. Just as he, Paul says to the Christians at Ephesus, just as he, God, chose us, chose you, me, if we're Christians, chose us in Christ, okay, that's nice, before the foundation of the world. What did he choose us to be? He chose us to be holy and blameless before him, before God, in love. How could God choose you? You didn't exist yet. In his plans, he chose you. Isn't that amazing then? I know, you know, in, in, in school, we used to have sports and different things, and sometimes you get, and you choose up sides, right? Well, that's great. So you choose people, but you, you couldn't choose somebody who didn't exist. But in God's plans, he could choose you by plan, according to program that he is laying out. He chose you to be what? Now think about this. If you think this isn't serious business, he chose you to be holy. He chose you to be blameless before time began. He had that in mind for you. Wow. So how important is that? Very important. Wow, I love it. Okay, let's continue. So we were there conceptually. I don't see how anybody can argue with that. All real human beings have a conceptual, but not literal, pre-existence. Okay. I think that's solid. I think we can, we can drive a stake in that and hang on to it there. We can, we can drive a nail in it and hang on to it. So then that brings us back to the, the question that, that caused us probably to, to venture into this subject this morning. I said we're, we're taking a little time off from John 1, 1 John 1. First John this morning, and uh, because somebody had said, I'd like to understand more about pre-existence, and they're really thinking about, okay, but they mean the pre-existence of Christ, but I think understanding the pre-existence of Christ under begins with understanding us and pre-existence, human beings. Okay, so then what about Jesus? Seeing what we have seen and learning what we've learned, let's continue. What about Jesus? Here's what I'm going to say in, in the remainder of our time. In these, in, as I said, we won't finish this today, so we'll probably spend uh, another session or two on this. But we're getting a good start on it today, I think. If he is a true human being, I'm going to allege, then he had a conceptual but not a literal preexistence. Wow. Okay. That fits with what human beings are and what they do. They don't pre-exist themselves. Okay. So uh, let's continue then. Christians, here's kind of our question then. Christians, after the Bible was written, I'll allege, began to talk about a literal pre-existence of Jesus. This is in the centuries after the Bible was written. And by the way, it led to endless problems and confusion for them. Because here's part of the issue. Well, wait a minute. If he pre-existed himself as some other kind of being, then what was the other kind of being? They had struggles over that. In fact, if you, uh, if you look at the theological history, and different theories about who Jesus was before he came to be Jesus. Very confusing. And they really fought that out. They had fistfights over that question. And uh, uh, the truth is, they were all missing it. Jesus did not literally pre-exist himself. Any good Orthodox Jewish Hebrew person 
could have told them that. But these were by now Gentiles who were living in a world where that you had spirits moving into bodies and stuff. So they thought in those terms. And that was not a biblical way of thinking, but that's what they thought. Uh, they were living in a, a Greek Hellenistic uh, ph philosophical world in which bodies were not so good. We still find that in Christianity today. They say they don't like uh, the, uh, uh, the Gnosticism that was against the body of Jesus. Uh, we don't like that. But on the same hand, on the other hand, they have adopted Gnosticism with regard to our Lord by saying, the body, that man, Jesus, he couldn't die for our sins because he wasn't good enough for that. Oh, really? See, that's leftover Gnosticism. That's warmed over Gnosticism that we're still having. We, so I, as I said, uh, you know, the, the, the church in the second, third, fourth centuries uh, began to say, you Gnostics, get away from us. And on the other hand, they were saying, oh, come on over. We, we, we kind of like a little bit of that Gnosticism business, the, the part about Jesus not being good enough to be the sacrifice for our sins. Now, we still see that today. But keep in mind where it began. What in your Bible? What scripture in the Bible ever said that? Not one. So it was in this Gnostic thinking, higher platitudes, everything that's really good and high is thought, not physical. And Jesus' body was physical, so it couldn't be too good. And that couldn't possibly be a sacrifice for our sins. Oh, my goodness. So anyway, so here we go. Uh, the idea, I say, and this is what we want to think about, the idea that he literally preexisted is an attack on Jesus being truly one of us for all the reasons we've just been saying this morning okay if he was truly one of us he didn't pre-exist himself as some other kind of being he just didn't if he was really one of us okay because we don't do that that's not human beings that's some other kind of being okay so here we go remember true human beings pre-exist conceptually but not literally and they pre-exist conceptually in God's mighty mind, his great plans, but not literally. Okay. Our very hope of salvation, though, hinges on him being one of us. Interesting, isn't it? Our, our Christian traditions over the centuries have kind of developed on this idea to present us with exactly the opposite conclusion. He really couldn't be one of us and bring us salvation. Not really just one of us. Oh, that would be terrible. I think it's quite wrong. That's quite the, quite the wrong idea. Actually, it hinges. The idea of our hope and salvation in Jesus Christ doesn't hinge on him being some other kind of being or a preexistent being or a being that then became a human being. It hinges instead on him being you, me, one of us. Yeah. Now, mind you, his dad was God. That's pretty good. But that didn't make him a different kind of being. That just changed who his dad was, <laughs> okay, from, from normal. Okay, God did not sin. Human beings sinned against God. I mean, this is pretty easy, I think. God did not need to personally sacrifice himself to himself. That gets pretty confusing. For someone else's sins, ours. And yet that's what post-biblical Christians decided must be the case. God had to give himself for our sins. And it gets very complicated after that. Well, God didn't sin. God doesn't need to make a sacrifice for sins. He sure doesn't make a need to make a sacrifice for sins to himself. We're the ones that did the sinning. We're the ones actually, and our third point is, it is we, humanity, who needed to make atonement to God for our sins. Now, mind you, we needed his help for that to happen. We couldn't just sit down as humanity and figure that out. He helped us to see how it could be done. But the key to all of that redeeming of humanity is in this one that he created, our Lord Jesus. One of us. Very important. Okay, let's continue. So Romans 5.15, I'll prove my point. He had to be one of us. You hear this exactly the opposite. Well, he had to be some other being. He had to be God. And others believe that he was an angel being. Okay, and, uh, and then became a human being. No, for goodness sakes, that's not us. We're not angel beings and we're not God beings and all that. 
No. So here it is. But Paul did lay it out. He laid it out clearly. But he's talking about the gift of salvation. He says, it's not like trespass. He says, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, who was the man by cause humans died? Adam. Yeah. And that's Paul's point. So he, we died because of what one guy did. That was wonderful. One of us. How much more did, and by the way, if you weren't a human being, I guess that didn't affect you. But, but how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the who? One man, Jesus the Messiah, the anointed Jesus, overflow to many. But it's not the one God Jesus. It's not the one angel Jesus. It's not the one, you know, being who is sort of like dual things or whatever. It's not that. It had to be one of us for God to work this out for us. That was God's plan. It was his eternal plan. So if you begin to toy with this idea and say, oh, well, but yeah, Jesus literally preexisted. And so that means that because he literally preexisted, he had to be something else. And then when he became one of us, he was really us. Plus he was the other. And no, you just went off in la la land there. That's not the story. I would ask any of our people anywhere and, 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 and theologians to find the scripture that ever said he had to be something other than one of us in order to bring us salvation. Where is it? I just found one that said he had to be one of us. Where is the one that said, oh, he had to be God to bring us salvation? Oh, he had to be an angel man to bring us salvation. He had to be some kind of spirit being from beyond. No. The Bible taught exactly the opposite. And it's time we stood up for the real Jesus Christ. The true human Jesus. The man Christ Jesus. Who's one of us? That's our hope. That's our salvation. We should never give an inch on that. Wow. So he said it there. One man, Adam, brought all these problems. And what is it that solved the problems? Some God man? No. Some angel man? No. But the one man, Jesus, the Messiah, he's the one who brought salvation to us. Now, God used him to accomplish that. But God didn't do it himself. Yeah. Jesus did. Okay. It was not a spirit being then becoming a man that saves us. Okay. It was not an angel becoming a man that saves us. The word angel man aren't even in the Bible. Okay. It was not God becoming a man that saves us. God man is not even the Bible. Wow. I mean, you know, make the, they make this huge deal out of this. Some do. And, and if, that, if it's that big a deal, why aren't your words even in there? Oh, I, I've run into that all very often. Well, Jesus was a God man. Okay, whoa, wait a minute. Which scripture said he was a God man? Which one? Ever said he was a God man? That phrase isn't even in there. It was rather a true human being, being one of us, who made the sacrifice for the rest of us. That was God's plan. And did God empower him? Yes. Did God honor that? Yes. Did God help work it all out? Yes. But was it also dependent on one of us? Yes. Was it dependent on one of us to obey God? Yes. That's the reason Jesus said in the garden, not my will, but thine be done. Wow. So that was our guy, our hero, our champion. What do you think? Let's continue for a moment. So in Romans 5, 17, we're just still in that same passage. We find it again, for if by the trans trespass of the one man, Adam again, right? We're talking about men, right? Okay. Death reigned through that one man. Death for who? Death for human beings. Reigned because of that one man. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of the righteousness of righteousness reign in life through the God-man Jesus? No. Not so. Will reign through the one man Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. Okay. A little bit further for a moment. 
To say that Jesus literally pre-existed is an assault on the very foundation of God's plan of salvation for us. So it's not just meaningless theology or just theories and stuff. It doesn't matter. Yes, it matters. It matters to our faith. It matters to how we look at Jesus, how we demean him and say, oh, he wasn't worthy. Hmm, he had to be something else in addition to being the real Jesus. That wouldn't do. So here we go. Means what? It's an assault because it would mean he's not really one of us, not truly a human being. He was some kind of then a hybrid being, actually. And then the language you use here used often is a dual nature human being. Oh, guess what? That one's not in the Bible either. Dual nature? Two natures? I don't know that the word natures is ever even used with reference to Jesus in any sense. And yet, we've done that, haven't we? Why? Because the man Jesus wasn't good enough for us according to Gnostic thinking, and later as brought into post-biblical Christian thinking. Yeah, that makes sense. The, the man wouldn't be good enough to buy our salvation. Oh yeah, well you forgot that this is the man that God looked from heaven and said, this is my son whom I love. I'm pleased with him. How often does God look down from heaven and take time to do that? Not that often. Does it mean a lot? Yes, it means everything. And it should mean everything to us. We should love that son as much as God does. Wow. Yeah. For goodness sakes. So then he was some kind of a hybrid being some kind of dual nature. If you hear people saying that, ew. You know, oh, what are you doing to my Lord? He died for us. He was one of us. He, he did accomplish the things he did by obeying God, not by being God. Right? Wow. Okay, continue. The Bible never said he had to be an angel or a God-man to purchase our salvation. What the Bible did say, and one more verse out of that series we're looking at, Romans 5, 19, For just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, this time who? Jesus, the many will be made righteous. This is our salvation. This is our hope. Oh, well, we're degrading Jesus by not letting him be a God-man. Oh, no, we're not. The Bible never made him a God-man. Never said that. A dual-natured guy. No. That's weird, isn't it? Anyway, when you think about it, we've just gotten used to it. When you hear something so many times said by so many people, we get used to it and say, oh, that, that, yeah, okay. No! We can't get used to it if it's not in here. We can't allow ourselves to say, oh, I guess that's okay. No! If they didn't believe it, we should be skeptical. Yeah, okay. Continue, please. This we know then. Jesus did pre-exist conceptually. And people generally ignore that. When's the last time you were in church and heard someone, a minister, a pastor saying, oh, let's talk about the conceptual existence of Jesus, the, the conceptual pre-existence of Jesus. Never hear that. Why? They ignore that. That would mean nothing to them. And generally speaking, never hear them talk about it. We talk about it. We need to talk about it more because we love our Savior. I don't like what they're doing to him. You know, you could, you could say it would be fun, I suppose, if you could say, well, Dan, yeah, Dan is, he's actually the President of the United States. And everybody believes that. Get, believe, I don't know if we can ever get that over. But anyway, so then after a while, people say, no, he's not the president. Well, you're demeaning him. Oh, you're not. I'm not him. Jesus is not God Almighty. We're not demeaning him. We're just telling the truth about him. We're putting him, putting him exactly where God put him, and we're going with it. So Jesus did pre-exist conceptually. So keep this in mind for our next discussion on this subject. But uh, in, in the next session, Jesus did pre-exist conceptually. God foresaw. He had to. Everybody would have to accept this. Saw the baby Jesus. Saw him growing in his mom. Saw Mary, his mother, right? He had that all in mind. He, he, uh, the angel came to Mary and said, you're going to have a baby before she ever even conceived. God had it in mind, didn't he? Sure, Joseph, his stepfather, he was there. And him, God saw him being born, saw him taking his first breath, coming like Adam, coming into existence.
coming to be a live being. And they saw him, God saw him growing up as a young man, Luke 2.52, and Jesus grew, what? In stature and in favor with God and with man. God saw that. Okay, continue please. So in our future sessions, we'll probably have at least another session or two on this. We'll see how we go. Uh, but... Uh, the, uh, but in our future session, we're going to talk about some other, th we'll talk about these things, but we're going to talk about some faulty understanding of scriptures that led to the literal pre-existence idea and still have people confused. But it's time for that confusion to end, okay? And then we'll talk about some correct understanding of Bible and Hebrew idioms that will, I think, open up the scriptures regarding pre-existence for us, okay? So Lord willing, perhaps we'll do that next week. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Divine love is eternal love. It flows from the great heart of Yahweh. His love is the single most powerful force in the universe. It is the very essence of who and what He is. Yahushua is a perfect revelation of Yahweh's love. The Son demonstrated how the Father would act, what He would say, what He would do under any and all circumstances. Eternal love is fully revealed in Yah's gift of His Son. The natural response of the heart that feels loved is to love in return, because love awakens love. To learn more about the infinite, inexhaustible love the Father has for you, look for the three-part article series, Eternal Love, on our website at worldslastchance.com. Again, read the Eternal Love series on worldslastchance.com. Fall in love with the best friend you will ever have. Our question today from our daily mailbag is coming to us from Tapio van Hannen in Espoo, Finland. You want to know something interesting? Well, what's that? Finnish athletes have won more medals per capita at the Summer Olympics than anyone else in the world, and they're second only to Norway for the number of medals per capita won at the Winter Olympics. Very good. Didn't know that. <laughs> I do now. I thank thought you'd you. like to know. Very, yeah, thank you. I really do appreciate that. Uh, anyway, Tapio says, I have a cousin who is struggling with alcoholism. I want to help him, but I'm not sure how. What can Christians do for someone struggling with addiction? Well, Tapio, I'm really glad to have been asked this because it's often easy when hearing about someone else who struggles to distance ourselves for no other reason than well, we don't have a problem with that. But the, the truth is, Sin is addictive. Now, that's all sin. So whether that sin is alcohol or nicotine, drugs, porn, escapism, anger, selfishness, cheating in school, dishonesty in business dealings, whatever it is, it's all addictive. So the principles that apply to helping an alcoholic apply to helping anyone struggling with sin. That makes total sense. So what's the first thing that we can actually do, though? The first and most important thing that any of us can do is don't denounce the sin your friend is struggling with may not be a temptation to you, but guaranteed you have your own areas of weakness. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of Yah. Secondly, we need to give them the same unconditional love that Yah has for us. Yahushua didn't wait for us to clean ourselves up. He saved us anyway. Let's just take a look at Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 10. This passage is one of the most powerful in Scripture, and it should inspire faith in anyone struggling with sin. It proves that Yahweh loves his enemies so much that he's willing to die for them. OK, I have it here, and it says, quote, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But Yah demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to Yahuwah through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Satan loves to press guilt on us because he knows that guilt is the most effective way to keep sinners away from the Savior. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Guilt over past sins. That can be really tough to deal with. But think about it for a moment. Mm -hmm. When Yahushua died on the cross, how many of your sins had yet to be committed? Well, all of them. It, I hadn't been born then. Exactly. And yet the Father's love is so great and so unconditional that Yahushua died for your sins and mine before we'd even been born. Remember that because our salvation is not based upon our performance, our abstinence from sin, it's based on what Yahushua did at Calvary. Yes, we're sinners, but Yah's grace is sufficient for even the worst of sinners. Amen. And if we want to be like him, we won't abandon someone who is struggling with an addiction. We won't judge or denounce him either. Just to turn over there to Hebrews 12. This yep. is an important point for anyone who wants to help someone struggling with an addiction. Just read for us verse 11, please, from Hebrews 12. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. As any loving parent knows, it's not fun to discipline your child, even if he or she deserves it. But sometimes it's necessary. When a friend or loved one is struggling with substance abuse, we can't just ignore it. We'd want help if we were in trouble, and we owe it as Yahushua's followers to help those we find in need. It's part of being a Christian. Yeah, and I think it's this is where a lot of us stumble. You know, people struggling with addictions may deny that they have a problem, but deep inside, they're typically well aware that they do. But it can feel overwhelming to try and quit, you know, say smoking or drinking. They often lash out. So what's the best way to approach someone who's been clearly battling addiction then, Dave? Gently, mm -hmm. being careful to respect their dignity. Yeah. Do it in private, don't embarrass them. Most of all, be very loving, understanding and non-judgmental, just as we want Yahweh to be when we turn to him for help with our sins. Mm -hmm. You see, if we sound harsh or condemnatory, if we come across as judgmental, we can do more harm than good. They can, in self-defense, reject anything we have to offer. But what do you think of um, Alcoholics Anonymous or similar 12-step recovery programs? Personally, I think it's a good idea for someone struggling with addiction to have someone to encourage and support him or her. It would be a lot more difficult to struggle through alone, wouldn't it? I think Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12-step recovery idea has helped a lot of people. I also think that this idea that once you're an alcoholic, you'll always be an alcoholic is helpful in the sense of being aware that when we've struggled with a particular sin, it's much easier to fall again in that area. Mm. However, this does not mean it's impossible to overcome. In Yahushua, it's possible to overcome any and every addiction by faith in Yah's promises and the merits of the Saviour's blood. I, I like the promise in John 16, verse 33. It, it says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Yeah, that's wonderful, isn't it? That's where mm. our hope lies. And it's there from which we draw strength to overcome. But it's important to understand that when a brother or sister is struggling, we're not to leave them to it. Could you just read First Samuel chapter 12, yeah. verse 23? This one here is a particularly powerful verse, and it shows the responsibility that each one of us has for our fellow sinners. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against Yahweh in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Again. Turn it round. If you were struggling, wouldn't you want someone to pray for you? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you want someone to claim the merits of Yahushua's blood on your behalf for victory? <laughs> I know I would. Absolutely. And it's that that's encouraging. And, and and that's what sinners need. Not condemnation to make them feel even more helpless, hopeless, and guilty. You know, I've always appreciated the description of the Saviour in Isaiah 42, verse 3, which says, A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. Yahushua didn't go around condemning others. No, he didn't kick a man when he was down. He always encouraged and uplifted, pointing the person who is struggling to the Father. 
and this is how we're to help others too. Share the promises with them. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, that's a promise for every situation. Mm. One thing that every addict needs, regardless of the addiction, is outside help. Sometimes this can be had through modern medicine. Sometimes counselling can help. But always be a friend. Be yeah. quick to uplift them in prayer. Be there to encourage them. Accountability also really helps the person who is struggling to overcome an addiction. And that requires someone who cares enough to get involved. One thing that's really helped me overcome certain sins has been in the morning to make a point of asking the Father to warn me when I'm in danger of being tempted. It's maybe through poor choices on my part. It may be through something completely beyond my control. But when I ask the Father to let me know when I'm in danger, I can ask him for help and strength before my emotions are even involved. Before I reach the point of really, really wanting whatever it is, I can just say a quick prayer for strength. And that, that's, that's really made a difference for me, Dave. Yeah, that's really helpful, actually. A person who's an alcoholic won't want to go to a liquor store. A person who's addicted to porn can set the controls on his computer so he can't access those sites. But sometimes, as we all know, Satan does a sneak attack. And when we're caught by surprise, it's easy to stumble. I like asking the Father to be your early warning system. Jack Wellman is a Christian author. He's written about overcoming addiction from a Christian perspective. And I've got a quote here that I've just printed off and I'd like you to read. It's just right there. You can see where I've marked it. Yeah, OK. It says, The next time you see someone battling with alcoholism or some other addiction, either illegal substances or even prescriptions, remember that they are battling something that they cannot overcome alone. We need to come alongside them as accountability partners and we must include them in our plans to make them feel part of the Christian community. The truth is, we all struggle with our own addictions and lust-based sins. It is by the grace of Yah that we ourselves are not in their shoes. So it's up to us to pray for them, encourage them and help them in any way we can, but without them taking advantage of us. There's a fine line between helping them and stripping all hope away. The best way to help someone struggling with addiction is to point them to the Father as the only source of real help. Pray for them. Teach them to claim the promises. Be willing to engage. Be an accountability partner. If there is a medical issue driving this, get them the help they need. This is being Yah's hands, his feet, his, his voice on earth. Yeah, and as we do this to others, Yahuwah accounts it as being done to help him. Now that's all we've got time for today with your questions. If you've got any more, then please drop us a line. Go to our website, worldslastchance.com, click on contact us. We might not be able to address everything on air, but at least we'll try to get it addressed in our Q&A section on our website. This is Elisa Bryan with today's Daily Promise from Yah's Word. In Luke 15, Yahushua told the story of a man with two sons. The younger son, being <laughs> rather spoiled and self-indulgent, demanded his father give him his share of the inheritance early. Just as soon as the youth received it, he left the family farm and moved to the city. You know the story. It wasn't long before the young man had squandered all his money, and when a famine came, he was out of money, out of food, and had no opportunities to earn either. He realized that his father's servants were better off than he was, and determined to return home, beg his father's forgiveness, and ask to work as a servant. He didn't presume to think he could be reinstated as a cherished son. He knew he'd done wrong, but if he could just work as a servant, he'd be grateful. He traveled toward home. But here is where his experience took an abrupt departure from his expectations. Yahushua said that while he was still a great way off, his father saw him, ran to him, and embraced him. The young man had 
barely gotten out his apology, and before he even had a chance to ask to be allowed to work as a servant, his father was whipping off his own outer robe and wrapping it around his son. He was calling to the servants to hurry and prepare a feast to celebrate his son's return. You see, every single day he had been gone, his father had been missing him. What's more, he had been watching for him. While the son was still a great way off, his father saw him and ran to him because he had been looking and longing for him. The Persian poet Rumi once wrote, What you seek is seeking you. No truer words could be spoken. Do you feel lost and forsaken? Are you looking for internal peace? but don't know how to obtain it. Arise and go to your father. He will meet you a great way off. If you take even one step toward him in repentance, he will hasten to enfold you in his arms of infinite love. His ear is open to the cry of the contrite soul. The very first reaching out of the heart after Yah is known to him. Never a prayer is offered, however faltering. Never a tear is shed, however secret. Never a sincere desire after Yahweh is cherished, however feeble. But His Spirit goes forth to meet it. Even before the prayer is uttered, or the yearning of the heart made known, the grace from Yahushua goes forth to meet the grace that is working upon the human soul. Haven't you waited long enough? Don't delay any longer. Go. He's waiting just for you. We've been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. been listening to WLC Radio. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return.